I'd like to welcome you to the first webinar of the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative Task Force on Education and Training. This task force is co-chaired by Dr. Libby Baxley and myself, and we invite your participation. If you are interested, please send a request for future agenda and information to Amy Gibson at pctcc.net. Um, we are very happy today to have two expert speakers who will address workforce development issues that are really central to the future success of the patient-centered health home. Dr. Jeffrey Borkin is the chair of the Department of Family Medicine at Brown University. He is also the board chair of the National Association of Departments of Family Medicine. He is a family physician, educator, researcher, and clinician whose career has bridged two fields, family medicine and medical anthropology. Dr. Justin Nash is a clinical health psychologist also at Brown University's Medical School where he is Director of Training and Education in the Centers for Behavioral and Preventive Medicine as well as Clinical Director of the Division of Clinical Behavioral Medicine. Dr. Nash is also an Associate Editor of the Annals of Behavioral Medicine and serves on the Board of the Council of Clinical Health Psychology Training Program. We look forward to their comments from Dr. Borkin and Dr. Nash as our task force begins its work to promote a workforce competent to work within a reformed healthcare system. If you have questions to ask, which we will spend the last 10 minutes or so of the session, please enter them in the Welcome to GoToWebinar, Web Events Made Easy, on the website in the very near future. Thank you. Dr. Borkin? Thank you. Well, we're thrilled to have the opportunity to present today. Um, this is an update and an expansion of a presentation uh, that was at the PCPCC Annual Summit. Um, and our goals are basically to look at workforce training and practice transformation patient-centered medical home at um, the, really the whole group of uh, healthcare specialists needed for PCMH teams. Uh, we're also, we spent some time looking at some of the key skills and competencies that would be necessary. Uh, we'll look at some of the strengths and uh, the really pretty incredible gaps and hope to um, have at least uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes to stimulate discussion, which uh, will then uh, presumably become the work of the task force going forward. So uh, if we looked at uh, a sample patient-centered medical home, let's call it ideal primary care, in 2011, they decide they want to become a medical home. They're very enthusiastic. They read about it in the Wall Street Journal and in their uh, nursing, uh, medicine, pharmacy, social work and psychology journals. But unfortunately, no one has any training in it. But they're a pretty adventurous group. They think they can do it anyway. Um, they go on the internet. They find some consultants. They spend a heap load of money. Um, they realize that for about $35,000, they'll have the promise of NCQA certification. Uh, the medical record's a little costly, but they think they can come in together. And they join every chronic care collaborative they can think of, as you might imagine. Bedlam ensues, and uh, none of it seems to work. The staff begins to revolt, the partners bicker, the patients get poor care instead of better care. Everyone gets demoralized, and uh, the practice becomes disorganized, and unfortunately, it closes 10 months later. This is not what we want. What we prefer is another model. Um, but we're in a national situation now. What if the Congress and the administration, for some odd reason, came together and mandated patient-centered medical homes to open next year around the country? I think at first we would celebrate what we're all interested in, but there's a very harsh reality, and that harsh reality is that when you look around, we have very few trained clinicians, administrators, or teams, and there's very few programs that are available out there currently running that are training the next generation. But there's more to the story. The hope is really on the way. What I think we've been observing, and since this was presented about a year ago, when we go online or we talk to people, we see that there's been a rapid expansion in the discussion of, of how we should train people in consultation services. There's been a variety of demonstration projects that involve trainees, new models of how we should train and where we should train, and there's been some um, ongoing efforts to collect and disseminate curriculum 
about patient centered medical homes and training that's required for that, starting um, with uh, some of the family medicine groups and now the task force. And this is uh, where uh, both Justin and I are in Rhode Island, and of course this is Prochaska, who's from the uh, University of Rhode Island, so we couldn't go without stages of change. But uh, as opposed to contemplation and preparation, we really, when we look around the country at the various specialty groups, health professions, we see that moving, that people are moving from contemplation and preparation to action. Uh, it's fair to say no one's in the maintenance or relapse or pre-contemplative stage, but um, at least we're moving around and beginning to, to show some action. So what was our data collection? We tried to go out and um, see what's present out there, uh, what's in the planning stages, what new models are emerging. We um, have tried to look at nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, pharmacists, psychologists, social workers, and physicians um, from uh, the three MD specialties and from AOA. Um, apologies, though, yeah, this is a rapidly changing field. and. Some of the information that's out there is it's truly just word of mouth, so we apologize if we happen to miss your group. Uh, this is, uh, things are happening fast. But we hope that we include some of the most up-to-date information um, over the next 35 minutes. So if you step back and you begin to say, when can we train people? When can we change behavior of health professionals? We actually have a variety of points in which we can intervene. We can, of course, do it, do it during their professional school, if there's graduate education involved in the training, the residencies, the fellowships, but um, that only hits the minority, and that's the, that's the upcoming generation. Uh, we also have the option for continuing education and professional development, and as we'll be talking about towards the end, um, there's the, uh, um, we can also change people's behavior through certification and recertification. And um, in each one of these kind of modal points, there's some examples that are already out there and more in discussion. So what we recognize is that the competencies or skills that are necessary to operate effectively within a patient-centered medical home aren't necessarily the ones that, uh, that clinicians and others have, have, have developed. Uh, so it means, in a sense, it's a transformation within an individual at some level uh, as well as the transformation within the practice at some level. And in particular, it's um, because many of the clinicians may have operated out of a kind of an individual-based approach. Um, what's particularly important is, is for the, the clinicians to start to work more with a team-based approach, taking a patient-centered, whole-person care, um, working within, learning how to work within the system, um, learning how to be part of a team and, and working effectively within a team. Um, and so actually we're going to just cover, over the next few slides, we're going to cover uh, some of these in a little more uh, detail. And these you could probably consider the domains of competency. So if you expand from the PCMH principles, um, as seen in the PCPCC uh, website, um, at a, at a minimum, these are the skills that we would potentially want to teach in which we would expect competence. There's also, uh, there's been some suggestions that those initial key skills are not enough. Uh, some of the work from the National Demonstration Project, uh, which was one of the earlier patient centered medical home trials, shows, showed that in addition to those previous skills, we need to be thinking about what uh, helps adaptive reserve within a practice. And some of that is uh, leadership, aligned vision, healthy relationships, that some of the other skills that might be broader that we need for patient-centered medical homes to be successful are creating a learning culture, being mindful, having reflection, making sense out of things, and having respectful interactions. So uh, one can actually see that the competencies and skills uh, can expand out depending on um, what we actually want to achieve and uh, if we want to ensure success. So what we recognize is that um, there are a number of lists out there in terms of competencies for particular professionals within disciplines, um, but also, just mentioned these last couple of slides, uh, for those who, regardless of their background, who are operating within, uh, within a medical home. Um, within these lists, though, I think what would help is if we can develop but some conceptual frame, and this is, can be some work that, that moves forward. Um, 
and, and this isn't necessarily any sophisticated conceptual framework, but it just starts to organize some of the competencies. In some ways, we can look at some of the foundational competencies. The foundational competencies are the ones that really serve as the base from which uh, the functional or the skills or the abilities of the, of the individual to work effectively within the practice. And, and I just, you know, we just listed a few that we consider key. Um, those who are going to work in this setting, it's important to have a real interprofessional, interdisciplinary understanding, and especially an appreciation. Um, the ability to work as part of a team um, and being able to work as part of a team is being able to form relationships and have effective collaborative relationships, and also the importance of communication and, and communicating efficiently. And, and when you have a number of disciplines who maybe treat uh, assess and treat individuals um, in their own practice, they don't uh, communicating efficiently isn't necessarily a top priority. But once it's in a team-based setting, it's particularly important. And then obviously the importance of individual and cultural diversity and recognizing the importance of diversity. So having these foundational skills then can serve as the base to, to uh, operate with the functional skills. And these are the ones that are, that are quite familiar to people. Um, but three that I want to mention in particular uh, are the, the ones of the importance of individuals to have an understanding about research, research methods, especially as they're applied to being able to evaluate programs and the effectiveness of programs. So this can tie into some of the quality initiatives and quality indicators. And then the importance of teaching. I mean, every individual, every discipline who's coming in and operating as a team member has something to share and teach to the other team members. So being an effective in teaching is important. And then uh, finally, um, management. There is, uh, it's not just treating the patient that's important, but also um, being able to have some administrative or management type of role um, for the particular disciplinary role and perspective that individual has within the larger team. So that's a tall order if you look at the competencies that one might consider necessary. Um, if we go onward and start to look um, profession by profession, um, and as you, you can actually add comments in the chat or put in questions later on, um, you may know about you may know about uh, some programs that are important that are out there that are just evol just evolving. So nursing. If you go back and compare those essential skills, you can see that many of them are intrinsic to the training and to the role, irrespective of the level. Um, nurse practitioners the same way. They're uh, part of very much what um, is being done in the nursing field. Fits many of the key skills. However, if we look for programs that are specific to the patient-centered medical home, whether it's specialty programs, courses, uh, they are lacking within the uh, nursing training. Physician's assistant. Um, you can see that the AAPA supports the medical home concept, and it, re it amended that in 2010. It does offer some CME sessions at educational conferences. There's journal and newsletter articles. And many essential skills are, once again, intrinsic to training in the role, whether it's team-based practice coordination or integration of care. However, at this point, we were unable to find any special programs, courses that train specifically for the patient center medical home. Pharmacists, it's, I think it's fair to say our evaluation is that the pharmacy uh, profession is the furthest ahead. They have actually um, taken on the question of what should be the role of the pharmacist within the primary care milieu, and uh, I guess contempor uh, contemporaneous with the development of the patient center medical home, decided that they would like to have an extended role, an expanded role that includes them as a provider of medical service functions within the team. So um, they have uh, seen themselves and developed curriculum as physician extenders. Um, and have uh, been doing this and teaching this at a variety of schools. Uh, and you can find those in Ohio, New Jersey, Minnesota, Washington, and others. So they're um, further along in terms of the uh, dialogue. We recognize the importance of behavioral health and the overall health of the individual. Psychologists, social workers, other are, uh, and others are important in being able to address the behavioral health needs of the individual, and particularly important in, in helping 
physicians and others in the medical home being able to address those needs. Um, there have been a number of initiatives that are, that are I would consider, at the early stage of development, but um, are moving along in development in terms of being able to prepare psychologists in particular to be able to operate within the medical home. The American Psychological Association has a number of initiatives underway from task forces to, uh, to uh, committees that are, that are helping to prepare the psychology workforce. Again, it's, I would consider it relatively early in its, uh, in its development. The VA has a major initiative to integrate psychological services into medical homes and has hired a number of psychologists and other behavioral health specialists uh, to operate within the medical homes. But what they're also recognizing is these uh, psychologists and others aren't necessarily um, well trained. The psychologists are well trained, but not necessarily um, trained in specifically for these particular roles. Um, HRSA has funds uh, for graduate psychology education. Those funds uh, can be used in part to actually train psychologists to be able to work effectively within medical homes. And we also see that there are, there are conferences that are uh, interdisciplinary conferences that uh, also have workshops and seminars and, um, and networking opportunities that help individuals become more familiar with working in medical homes. So, you know, the psychologist role is not, uh, it's not only about assessing, treating um, individuals and, and, and consulting with others on the medical team. Psychologists actually have uh, some unique skills um, that are particularly relevant for, for uh, medical homes. In particular with the uh, scientific training of psychologists, they have an understanding of research methods. Those research methods can be applied to um, to program evaluation efforts and quality improvement efforts um, within the setting. And also psychologists are in a position where they're, a, uh, they're able to help train others in understanding uh, prevention, particularly disease prevention, and also management, particularly self-management of chronic disease. And so when you're looking at the, the, um, the, the interventions of, or the targets of the interventions of psychologists, it's not only addressing the traditional kind of mental health needs, but it's also helping with health behavior change through a number of uh, brief uh, techniques, motivational interviewing, behavioral activation, others, helping with uh, chronic disease management, and, um, and also helping the members of the team uh, work, uh, uh, function effectively as part of the medical home. And I, uh, as I was mentioning, it, what is developing within psychology is not considered a formal specialty at, at this point, but there's a lot of interest and initiatives that are happening. So uh, there could very well be the time when uh, primary care psychology becomes a formal specialty. Um, and as I mentioned, there are a number of increasing formal training experiences. They, right now, they're tending to be at the postdoctoral fellowship level, but we're also finding over 100 Internship uh, experiences have at least a minor, rota at least a major rotation in primary care psychology. Over 200 have at least a minor rotation, and this is developing fast. Uh, what is is happening less are practicum experiences at the doctoral level and formal training at the doctoral level. Um, but we also are seeing there's a number of postgraduate certification training programs that have developed and are developing. The, uh, the newest one is the Fairleigh Dickinson University Certification Program. The more developed one is the UMass Medical Center one. And, this, and then uh, an intensive training program also exists at the University of Rochester. And these training programs are, are in behavioral health, um, and they're not specific to training psychologists, the social workers, nurses, and others uh, engage in that training as well. And then also, social work plays an important role. Social work and psychology in many ways overlap, but they also have very quite distinct roles. Social workers take the perspective of looking at the whole person, and they also look at that person in the context of the support system. And so it's looking at that individual and they're functioning across multiple domains. And so social workers are able to assess and intervene and consult at multiple levels, not only at the individual level, but particularly in the context of the family and intervening directly with the family and also understanding the community, the community resources, and how to engage the community in helping the individual and the individual's family. 
And if we look at um, the Affordable Care Act, and we look at its relevance for social work, uh, if we look at three priorities, is the, is the importance of limiting the readmissions and the importance of community-based care and the transitions that are occurring, and sometimes the problems with uh, that occur with, with transition. Social work obviously can play an important role there. Um, enhancing independence at home is another area where social workers can be really important. And then, uh, obviously, we know about the, the importance of patient-centered medical homes and interdisciplinary community health teams. And social workers can operate effectively there as well. So, and this is Jeff, I'm, I think in, in, on social work, I think that it's similar to the, what we described with nursing, that there are many intrinsic shared roles that overlap with the patient-centered medical home, but at this point, um, we are unable to find any uh, courses, programs, um, or fellowships uh, in social work, uh, specifically on the patient-centered medical home. So, let's switch gears to medical and osteopathic students. Um, it's clear that if we're going to change practice, we need to change uh, how we train those students. Um, we found that uh, with DOs and with MDs, there's students, there are uh, uh, some exposure, depending if they're lucky enough to be at a patient-centered medical home site. Um, there's a few uh, but growing number of programs that have curricula that are focused around the patient-centered medical home, um, and there's some presentations. I'll pick out one best practice, and uh, though you can't find it on the website, Paul Grundy himself just, uh, promised me that this is already uh, underway, that the University of Oklahoma in Tulsa uh, decided that they were going to uh, throw in uh, their lot with the patient center medical homes, and that they have changed multiple areas of their, multiple practices, PCMH uh, level two and three medical homes, and that they've changed their curriculum for the medical students. Another example uh, is the educational initiative in Ohio. This is House Bill 198 that uh, as part of the project to convert 44 practices, they realize, and I think this is happening in a lot of areas, if we're going to change the practices, we, we sure as heck better get people who are trained to work in them. So um, these are 44 practices, 40 led by physicians, 4 by advanced practice nurses. Part of the plan for the physician-led practices is that they would affiliate with one of the MD or DO schools. Um, and that, I, from what I understand, is underway. And the deans of the medical school were going to provide 50 scholarships. So this is a, an exciting uh, new program because it links practice transformation with uh, workforce training. If you can't get them in medical school and osteopathic school, you can catch them in residency. Um, I think that we've been seeing in pediatrics, family medicine, and internal medicine, um, select uh, growth of new programs. Uh, some of the most exciting ones are the Washington State Medical Home Collaborative and the I3 that the co-chair of this group, Libby Baxley, is one of the leads on that. There are now up to 23 programs in family medicine, IMNPs from South and North Carolina and Virginia, as well as the seven programs in Colorado. The OA has been developing some PCMH modules, and uh, if one speaks to residency directors um, across the country, is the beginning of discussion of how we do that, including here. One example of this was the P4 initiative uh, that came out of family medicine, where they tried to um, uh, leapfrog uh, development of family medicine residencies. Although of the uh, 14 residencies selected, uh, not all of them focused on PCMH. I'll give two examples of really dramatic changes where um, with um, some outside consultation with a lot of effort from within and involvement of people with, at all levels, um, they were able to make a major impact on PCMH training uh, among their residents. Uh, the first example of a best practice is Middlesex Hospital Family Medicine Residency Program in Connecticut. Uh, I'll let you go over this later, but just to show you that not only were they able to, to uh, institute a new curriculum, they were able to show results. And, uh, these are available at the PCPCC and the P4 site, but they were able to show that they were exposing residents to new models of practice, and I didn't include it here, but they were also able to learn and demonstrate in practice maybe many of the, of the key skills. So this was exciting because they not only did it, they evaluated their outcomes. Another best practice from Allentown, PA, 
Um, they were able to uh, organize residents and faculty into two continuity care teams at community care sites. And together they were working at, from the get-go with nurses, social workers, psychologists as a team with shared panels. And um, they were able to schedule regular meetings. They were able to become more effective um, within the defined structures. Um, they were in, able to incorporate group dynamic leadership theory, a variety of tools, not just on the theoretical level, but in practice. So uh, this is another exciting example where the ideas were incorporated into practice and then evaluated rigorously. Finally, we couldn't uh, go uh, talk about residency training without talking about the Swedish Family Medicine Residency in Ballard. The reason it's so important is that they started this residency as a patient-centered medical home. Uh, not only did it meet NCQA and other criteria, they were able to go to the insurers and get payment reform as a key component of this model. So uh, I think that uh, it's extremely exciting that this residency, which is uh, sponsored by Swedish Hospital, was able to change residency training but also change payment to reinforce those behaviors. So if you don't get them in medical school or osteopathic school or during graduate medical education or other kind of internships, well, can you get them during fellowships? And, and I think that both Justin and I were expecting to see just a whole host of fellowships out there for patient-centered medical homes. We thought that there would just be gads of them. So is there a broad range of PCMH programs? Well, we believe as of April 2011, uh, there are no fellowship opportunities in PCMH. Why no one starts them, I'm not sure. Um, there are some that are closed, particularly in the Veterans Administration, uh, Health Services Research Quality Improvement. You can get an MPH, but um, there's nothing that um, uh, will create the, the thought leaders and evaluation leaders in PCMH that we know of in terms of fellowships. So um, what about all those people in practice or the ones that you missed during medical education or fellowship or residency training? Well, the good news is that there's major opportunities for learning in just a host of health professional areas, and that's continuing education. Uh, it's required by almost all of the health professions. And maybe a comment that I can make about continuing education is, let's, you know, when we when we look at um, individuals who have who have operated more in isolation, and then to make the transition to be in a team-based approach and to be able to actually integrate care, it's actually a difficult transition. So these continuing edu education programs are important, but they're not only um, helping individuals learn some of the language of operating in a primary care medical home, the patient-centered medical home setting, but they're also having to transform how an individual operates. And what it's important is for, is for these clinicians not to revert back to um, co-locating their care and, off, and operating with individuals in isolation and the importance of uh, integrating care along with the physician and with the other members of the team. So what's out there in terms of continuing education? Well, most of the professional organizations offer some sort of continuing medical education on patients that are in medical home or associated skills. There's also just a host of companies that have uh, begun to offer this. This is a, a profit uh, center item. Uh, and this is just an example of, um, of one that will remain nameless, but offers licenses in multiple seats. Um, so this is happening across the country. Uh, and finally, what's I think been very creative and very exciting is that um, if you really want to change behavior, you, you add something that's extremely high stakes to it. So within the recertification and certification uh, marketplace, family medicine, uh, internal medicine, and pediatrics have added some aspects of practice transformation uh, to their requirements. So within family medicine, there's performance and practice. The internists are doing evaluation and performance. There's resources that are available for that for self-learning. And the pediatricians who started the patient-centered medical home movement um, have enhancing quality improvements in pediatric practice which was launched last year. And as we uh, looked around the country and around uh, uh, for what's present, how are we going to train this uh, several million person workforce, um, uh, we realized that um, putting them through graduate schools or residencies is not going to be the only way. 
we're really going to need um, a variety of, of new and advanced models. So um, the fortunate part is that these are really evolving out there. There's distance learning, so teleconferences, podcasts, webinars like we're having today. There's, there's consultants who are in the flesh and virtual consultants. And there's um, opportunities for local assistance and facilitation. Um, online collaborative networks and cooperative extension services. We'll go through a few of those. So we start with pediatrics. Um, they got into the medical home business first, and um, they um, are now been very quickly trying to catch up in terms of their own online toolkits, but have uh, their toolkits and building blocks, podcasts, listserv. They have some limited technical assistance that they can provide. Um, and, and interestingly, they're, they're, even though they started it, they're branching out from a focus on children with special needs to all children. So if you look to the National Center for Medical Home Implementation, it will lead you to um, just a host of great tools. Um, it, within the pediatric world, there are some other uh, uh, notable resources, and this is not an exhaustive list, but um, the Medical Home Portal and the Center for Medical Home Improvement also have information tools and resources. This is mostly um, do it on your own, but some of them offer consultations uh, that uh, you can have either um, online or in person. The American College of Physicians has been very active, uh, particularly through their medical home builder. Um, they have a, it's a self-paced program that can uh, first biopsy your practice and then give you suggestions for where to go. Uh, it's a, a great program that's been used by just a host of, of primary care physicians, and uh, nicely it's available for continuing medical education credit. Then uh, pr the the effort which, uh, uh, though it originated in family medicine, from what I understand, has been used uh, even more widely by internists is Transform Med. And this is uh, similar to the other services, um, except that uh, they've expanded some of the um, milieus that are available. So they have both a Delphi online teaching group. They're also able to send people to be with you on the ground. So they expand from the web-based toolkit to coaching facilitation, tailored training, practice retreats, online collaborative networks. So different kind of learning styles, different kind of learning options. And why this may be important is um, our, our sense, and uh, we're now a level three patient-centered medical home here within our residency, and I think Rhode Island has the, we, we, our claim to fame is the greatest number of level three NCQA uh, providers of, uh, per capita of any state. But as you probably know, some of this shouldn't be done alone. Um, uh, this takes help. So it, this is just a slide from the National Demonstration Project, basically showing that um, those uh, individuals who had facilitated um, who had facilitated uh, practice transformation efforts were much more successful than the controls who uh, knew about some of the ideas but would have had to do it on one's own. So uh, this is only a, a small piece of evidence showing that although self-learning tools are great, it probably requires someone either nationally, locally, who can actually step in and help with your individual practice. Um, there was big hope uh, in the um, uh, reform, the healthcare reform law for cooperative extension services that are present in states uh, like Colorado and New Mexico uh, that, that respond, as I'm sure you all know, from the agricultural extension programs, uh, including something like the 4-H Club. Um, it was going to help uh, provide expertise uh, on the ground everywhere that uh, providers exist. Um, it was put into law with money, but it unfortunately did not get funding. Um, there has been a small effort by HRQ. Uh, they're, they're putting out three grants that, uh, the, 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 um, that several states applied for. The results aren't in yet, but the overall cooperative extension program uh, looks like it'll wait for another day. So we're just about at the discussion phase. Um, I think that we wanted to raise a few questions and hopefully we raise some ideas for you. So um, it's clear to us that sound educational models need to be developed for different disciplines. We actually expected to find more out there. Um, and it, it's not just also the curriculum. We think that professional schools need to select students 
and support them and train them who are ready to work in PCMH. And that may be a slightly different kind of student. You saw the core skills. And maybe people have better communication skills, are able to work in teams, are non-hierarchical, have some evaluation training. Um, we we'll look across the country, although there's some, a few remarkable examples of teamwork and interdisciplinary training, um, it's far, uh, few and far between. Um, I think it's also clear to us that this is not something that's going to be learned at one stage and then uh, never returned to. We're going to have to introduce educational interventions at every stage and use broad education consultant, consultancy models um, that are both strong in terms of their online form and available on the ground. And as I think we're seeing uh, from the, the NDP and others, you have to link payment reform to these education efforts. So if the primary care medical home uh, goes live, again, they, in 2012, uh, they, they decide to put it off for a year. Ideal primary care decides they want to do it. Our hope would be that all members of the interdisciplinary team receive some sort of PCMH training at each stage of their education. The local PCMH practices who are already uh, patient-centered medical homes offer to mention them. There's consultancy agencies that provide online and on-the-ground guidance. The Cooperative Extension Service gets funded by the federal government. They send their agents to provide continuing advice and assistance at each stage. Payment reform follows. The insurers change their compensation model, as has happened in states uh, like Rhode Island already. And that the practice successfully makes the transition to PCMH, increases not only the satisfaction of patients' clinicians, and that's getting back to that, that goal of joy that uh, Wagner was speaking about recently, but health outcomes in the bottom line improve as well. That group becomes mentors. Their children join the 4-H club. And this version of 4-H is health, humanism, medical home, and happiness. They win, they win first prize at the state fair and later on become PCMH providers themselves. So our hope is a medical home in every community and an educated, competent team for every home. Um, it's a big task, uh, overwhelming if you think about the, uh, the range of individuals and groups that we have to um, impact upon. But um, it's very heartwarming uh, to see what's been done in the past two years. And uh, I think that the 113 people on the call will likely be some of those individuals to make a difference. We open it up for uh, uh, Libby or Cynthia to uh, lead the question and answer. Great. Thanks, Jeff. This is Libby Baxley um, from University of South Carolina, and I have the privilege of serving with Cynthia uh, with this group. Several of you wrote in questions. And uh, first of all, let me thank um, Jeff and Justin for their conversation today. It was very comprehensive. A lot of good questions that have come from this. Several of them uh, are centered around the notion of when to seek, when and how to sequence this training. Is you went through a series related to um, medical student, first year, pharmacy, nursing, uh, other health professions. Is this a first uh, first stage out of the blocks in professional school? Is this a postgraduate or postdoc level? Um, is that the best place to start? And then is it different uh, where you start depending on the health professionals, given that you want to have the, the, the current settings where the entire office or the entire future office of a PCMH has the opportunity to have training together, not separately the way we do most health professions training now? So that was a big, a big question, but a number of questions about that particular issue. I just think it points to the importance of uh, see, uh, many of the of the professionals who operate who will be operating in patient-centered medical homes uh, maybe went into their profession to uh, treat individuals and to do it individually, and this is a very different way of care. And so um, it you know so one approach is you tr you train each discipline separately and then you bring them together to um, operate in practice. Another approach is to start to train the disciplines together. 
And we actually can start to see that. An example of that is where we see programs developing where psychology residents, fellows, are being trained right alongside family medicine residents, fellows. So um, I, I think it's, an, it's a good point, it's an important point, um, where there is an opportunity to train the different disciplines together, I think it can make a difference. And, and this has come up, I think it's a you know, great series of questions. Um, at, the, at the core health professional school, um, those are undifferentiated nurses, doctors, uh, social workers, psychologists, physician assistants. Um, we're, there's likely a set of skills that are germane to all of them irrespective of what they do. Um, one of them is, for instance, team-based team, the team -based care. Whatever field they're going to be in, they're going to be working with the team. It seems a shame that in many places the first time they actually uh, see another student in another discipline is when they're actually on the floors or in the office. So we think that, it's, that some of these things have to be incorporated earlier and that some of the skills, um, such as how to practice transformation, is going to be as relevant if we, speak, if we think of the medical arena to urologists as it is to family doctors and pediatricians. Um, they're going to have to run offices and think about new methods and models of care. Um, the problem is you can't train, can't train everyone in everything. So my guess is that at some uh, grand point in time, we'll figure out what needs to be taught uh, at what evolutionary stage. Great. Um, another series of questions had to do with the non-clinical contributors to the medical home. So, for instance, the role of folks in an MPH or health administration uh, master's or doctorate program for administrators uh, in the medical home, the people who will need for setting up policies and procedures, the people who will be giving us the data that we'll need to be able to use to make decisions. Um, so even beyond the health professions training, how do we incorporate those folks? Uh, in our case, we're working actually with industrial engineers from one of the universities nearby um, who are good at looking at healthcare systems and flow and efficiency and relationships even within a team. So. Any, uh, any thoughts about how to expand out or um, ideas that folks have about who else is part of what we need for the medical home, even in the non-clinical area? Um, well, I'll take a first step. It's a great question. I think that one of the pieces that's arisen in this, uh, discussions of patient-centered medical home is that we have to change the culture of the practice, maybe the culture of society. So it involves essentially patients and uh, in addition to those who are involved in the patient center medical home. It's, um, it's kind of a, a transformative personal experience for anyone who comes to work in that setting. I think that it's absolutely true that if we have administrators who are not on board, um, how are we actually going to move forward? And where do we actually train them up or help to inculcate the skills? You know, part of it is on who we choose, but I think we need a much more formal uh, basis for that. Uh, for issues, for degrees like um, MPHs, those are some critical skills for evaluation. And um, depending on how it's combined with, or if it's combined with a clinical um, skill, those are certainly individuals that need to be incorporated into the team. Yeah, I think that um, where we see most of the training occurring is in the practice settings, obviously because that's where the greatest need is. Um, and where there's an opportunity is at the campus, is on campuses and, and within universities and academic centers to be able to, to engage in training as well and partner with some of these practice settings. I mean, if, if we notice, uh, if we just look at psychology, what we notice is campus-based at the doctoral level, relatively little training, formal training is being done compared to what we see at the advanced postdoctoral stage. Great. I, mean, I will. Uh, thank you. I will add to that uh, by saying that in the collaborative that Jeff mentioned that we've done in, in North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, when we uh, when we put together the template for teams to participate in the collaborative, the types of people they would need in their settings, one of the people, one of the types of people that we required each of the teams to have on their work group was the data, whoever their data manager was, which sometimes meant going to the larger health system, sometimes was internal. But um, So getting them to think outside the clinical mode. The university level, we've got a, 
uh, Masters in Health Administration and MPH program here, and we actually have utilized grad students on a regular basis, both at, as, um, as GAs, but also for longer term residencies, uh, one of whom is going to be doing a residency with us starting the summer, and it'll be a year-long focus on medical home, and will help us take our 08 to 011 uh, changes that we need to do to get to sort of new criteria and to step up our our investment in the things we're doing around medical homes. So I think if you are in settings like that where you can think about tapping into other professional schools, good things come from that in terms of their learning. It's also really good to be able to add those resources of folks who can do that kind of work in your practice and you're not putting it on the backs of folks who already have full-time jobs. So, um, all right, uh, other questions. The, uh, there's a question about looking for settings in which there's a business model to support this. Um, I guess both PCMH and particularly education around PCMH. And the question was asked about Medicaid or self-insured employers. Um, any ideas you have about looking for settings where the business model would support the educational component? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I know that in some of the collaboratives, um, there's money that's put aside um, that's per uh, patient, per member, per month. So, um, for instance, in, our, in addition to fee-for-service, some of those dollars in many of the collaboratives um, need to go to education and conferences. So one piece is that um, who, that when insurers or governments um, or states begin to uh, push to support the PCMH model, that they incorporate um, as a requirement training of teams. And I think that's one of the ways in which it will be paid for. The other way is that if it's incorporated as part and parcel of the key skills needed for the individual to graduate from that particular field or become certified. So it's probably number, uh, an integration model. So it, it's um, nobody gets through an MPH, an admin, a health administrative degree, or any health professions degree without learning about teamwork. Uh, they have to do it in their certification. They have to do it as part of their CME. And then if they join a collaborative, it includes conferences, team meetings that um, begin to change the culture and, and begin to show how those things work in practice. But it's, um, I think it's fair to say one of the reasons we're not seeing more programs out there um, is that there hasn't been a lot of money to do that. Uh, HRSA has, uh, has been a, somewhat supportive of, of pushing that for the primary care specialties, but in general, um, I think there's the expectation that this will be uh, incorporated uh, for free into all of our programs. Great. Thank you. Um, one of the participants commented that many of the geriatric fellowships cover the majority of the competencies when you were uh, speaking about fellowships, um, again, I would add to that saying that, that uh, there may be programs out there and, and hopefully this task force will be able to identify some of those that uh, may be doing that but not be named in a way that you would have identified them. Uh, for example, we have a PGY4 fellowship in, in primary care quality improvement, largely focused on PCMH, but you wouldn't have found it by looking at PCMH. Um, in the name of the fellowship. So hopefully this group can identify and over the course of our work to those that might be out there. There was a question about health oh, coaching Oh, just talking training. about that, Libby, which is, which is actually a very positive point, which is fields like geriatrics, like we mentioned, PAs, NPTs, that their basic training and philosophy um, incorporates many of the key skills already. Um, right. So that, that's one of the ways in which we can be successful. There's other groups, we won't pick them out, you know, maybe plastic surgeons, who we think would be less likely to uh, fit into a PCMH model without some retraining. Great. There's a question about health coaching training and the role of health coaching training for health professionals. Does that help um, in this process? It seems like it would be great. Um, I think the whole issue of coaching within uh, health professions is just emerging. But that's um, it's interesting to see that this gets along with the facilitation, that who are these facilitators when they're on the field? They are basically coaches um, who are working with practices and individuals. So I think that's a, a model we'll see more of. Great. 
Yes, and basically it's an interest, uh, issue of behavior change and how do we most effectively and efficiently change behavior, both of the professionals and of our patients sometimes. Yeah, and interesting parallel there. Um, the same skills could be able mm -hmm. to apply. There was a question about uh, a few slides earlier from the end slide. There was a diagram of PCMH, and one of the squares in your diagram pertained to HIT. And the question was, will the HIT programs change with the introduction of PCMH? Um, and are you aware of programs that are doing that around the country? And so I guess by that it means uh, potentially vendors and how they're looking at electronic health records and other HIT components that would support the medical home. Um, have you seen any indication that the uh, what's out there or what's coming is going to be tailored to what we need in a holistic way around medical homes. I think maybe others on the call would be um, more able to answer that, but certainly the um, the efforts uh, that were first um, uh, pushed by CMS that Blumenthal was involved in that were supposed to create new models of HIT. I think the people have kind of finally gotten it on the HIT world that our, that our uh, various programs have to speak with one another in a way which is useful to share information and summarize information. So I think that, that we're starting to see records, um, easier data sharing, better use of uh, kind of the ability to monitor chronic care collaborators. And if we live long enough, we may see easily um, extractable data so we can actually get a dashboard for what we're doing in PCMH. I think people are talking about it. Some of the healthcare, and, and I, I don't know the others can comment more, but I think that that, it, that the word is out that um, our HIT needs to more meet the needs of uh, that are similar to PCMH. Great, thank you. That's all the listed questions that I was able to see on my screen. They were great questions. Um, if anybody has anything else and wants to, are they able to unmute that themselves, Lauren? Or Amy, or? All right. Justin or, or, or Jeff, do you have any closing comments that you'd like to make? Well, I, my, just my, my only closing comment is that uh, it, in many ways it's, a, it's an exciting venture. It's one that, um, you know, as we're transforming medicine, we're having to transform the individuals and in how they operate within medicine, but it prevent, presents a great opportunity to be able to provide, have the potential of providing high-value care in a way that hasn't been delivered before. Uh, the key, in a way, rests on training the workforce, and um, and I, I think you know this is the start to get a better understanding of all the issues that are involved. Great, great. I just said I think it's an exciting time. Uh, PCMH and has been going on now for four or five years at the police, and it's just now that the um, education task force is getting going. I think mm -hmm. that uh, people around the country are beginning to realize, hey, this might be catching on. Who's going to actually mm -hmm. work in these places? Um, the need is enormous, but I think that uh, what's exciting is that people are really beginning to, um, to take the bull by the horns and move forward. So I thank you for the participants for um, dialing in and to the organizers for allowing this to be the first webinar of the Education Task Force. Thank you guys so much. And for those still on the line, remember that our ne next Task Force call will be on Wednesday, May 11th. We'll be sending out information ahead of time related to the um, outline of things that we want to, that we're going to propose that we, um, that we do to try to identify programs that are out there and to come up with a framework for how training could be organized around PCMH. And we'll get that to you in advance. Uh, remember that the copies of these slides will be available uh, on the PCPCC website and we'll get uh, word out to the task force when that becomes available. They will be there. Um, in the near future. And uh, thanks to Amy Gibson and Lauren Vandegrift for getting the webinar up and going, and again to Justin and Jeff for, for putting on our first webinar for us. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you all for participating.
Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.